Pakistan's position in the global tech space. Uh, more importantly, we will be hosting more than 300 speakers and allowing more than 70,000 visitors to come experience them. These numbers are telling of just the tip of the iceberg, the potential that Pakistan possesses. And what more can be expected from the young blood in the country who are excellent at what they put their minds to. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it uh, from the country principal officer and the education lead of Microsoft. Please welcome Mr. Gibran Jamshed. Honorable executives, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. It is indeed a matter of privilege and pride for me to be here standing in front of you today. The first box on the presentation you see definitely represents the journey of ITCN, a great milestone. I've been personally following up on ITCN since I was a computer science student. The second box on this slide represents us as Microsoft. We are also here in this market for the last 25 years. And just like IDCN, we have also contributed to the overall tech economy and the society of this country. I don't in want to or intend to spend a lot of time on the stage. I would just want to move past with some of the slides I have, uh, provided this slideshow works. Okay. Right. So as Microsoft, our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And when we talk about this mission, we talk about four things. We want to create an equal opportunity for everyone who is associated with the overall tech ecosystem. Whether you are a Microsoft customer, partner, community, or government. Then the idea is to gain trust, trust from the customers, and earn trust from the governments. Whatever we do, we make sure that we are protecting the fundamental rights of the society. And last, but very important is, how do we become environment friendly, and how do we contribute towards climate change and sustainability? AI is definitely transforming the entire world. It's a $10 trillion opportunity we are already entering into the fifth industrial revolution. Fifth industrial revolution is an era where they say humans and machines would dance together. And when we talk about the fifth industrial revolution, I think every government, every country, every organization, every individual is trying to align themselves with this era of AI. And Microsoft has obviously established a clear market leadership when you talk about the artificial intelligence in today's world. I think this logo would be, uh, on the back slide it was a logo you have seen for like few seconds and minutes. Uh, this would have been very familiar. This is a logo of Copilot. And whatever experiences you get from Microsoft, right, you would see this logo. And the first experience right now is what was it was called formerly Bing Chat, right? And when people were searching and creating and generating the content in their personal lives, uh, AI told them this is the way how the content would be generated and how you would interact with the search engine. We go to the next slide very quickly. Is it working now? Okay. I'm sure everybody who is part of any educational institution today, or you are a part of, let's say, a bank or a telecom or any other industry vertical healthcare. Microsoft 365 is the first choice of productivity platform when it comes to interacting with uh, content and tools and office automation. And today, Microsoft Office is not the same as it was a couple of years ago. We have grounded Copilot on Microsoft apps and data. And this is where the entire game is changing. You have got a content writer sitting on your desk who is helping you create some great PowerPoint presentations on a click of a prompt. 
you have got a data scientist sitting in your office who is helping you do some Excel number crunching and data mining just at the tip of some prompts. You are not there, you have missed a certain meeting, and somebody is there to take notes for you, somebody is there to recap the meeting or to summarize the meeting for you, and the list of scenarios go on and on. And that is very evident because today, 60% of the Fortune 500 companies, they are already using this technology. The next is something which is quite close to my heart, GitHub, which was acquired by Microsoft, which automates the complete DevOps lifecycle. It is a home to 100 million developers. And imagine, developers who are creating AI, AI is helping developers to become more productive and more agile at the end of a day. So there are close to 2 million paid subscribers of GitHub Copilot as well. And you are creating and generating the code at the click of a prompt. So I think it is also very feasible and very productive for the developer audiences. Uh, they have got a junior developer or an assistant working for them who is writing the code for them. But imagine somebody like me who doesn't know how to code. And if I want to write a code, I don't need to go and find services of a developer. I would just go to the GitHub Copilot, and the GitHub Copilot would generate this code for me. And this level of integration is there across all products and platforms, but obviously we would not have time to go through it. Uh, then there are certain scenarios. Organizations, I know they are already using other products as well. There are organizations whose ERPs are running on, let's say, SAPs and Oracles of the world, and they want to extend these co-pilot functionalities to those applications and want to turn them into smarter and intelligent applications at the end of the day. This is where the co-pilot studio is also available. And there are 1,100 plus connectors which are built into the co-pilot studio. And we have got 30,000 plus deployments of this co-pilot studio in less than one year down the road. So now the idea is also to pick up those industry leading applications as well and integrate them back with the co-pilot ecosystem. Azure, I think everybody knows what Azure is after all these years. It's the world's largest cloud computing platform. And today, Azure is being presented as the AI supercomputer. OpenAI, innovation from OpenAI, everybody knows the large language models coming out of OpenAI, GPTs and codecs and whispers of the world. And these models are available on Azure. And 65% plus Fortune 500 companies are using today these models on top of Microsoft Azure platform. It's not only about the large language models or the small language models coming in from the Microsoft and OpenAI family, but when you talk about the models coming out from Meta, Mistral, you talk about Hugging Face, you talk about NVIDIA, Snowflakes, and the list of these organizations go on and on. Azure has become that kind of an AI supercomputer or a marketplace or a hub where every single AI project is happening. Because you would need access to the base technology in scenarios where, for example, tomorrow, you want to put this GPD technology on your core banking application, which is not supported by, let's say, the Copilot Studio or not supported by Microsoft. You have to create this model from scratch. And this is where you would go and you would get services of the Copilots and uh, GPTs and LLMs available on the Azure, coming in from multiple players, whether they are closed source, they are open source, uh, they are small language models, they are large language models, and this is a game-changing technology uh, which is uh, pushing companies to do more with less. LinkedIn, I think everybody sitting in this room is using LinkedIn because there are one billion plus, plus professionals uh, who are using LinkedIn today. And the real success story and the real power of LinkedIn is not that people just go and make up their profiles and they connect with people, they, they are putting up the post and they're getting likes and reactions, uh, or they are trying to find new opportunities and jobs. But there is a very strong module which is available within LinkedIn. This is called LinkedIn Learning. And what Microsoft and LinkedIn teams have done over the last one year, we have published 12 courses on LinkedIn Learning, which comes at no cost to literally everyone on this planet, and they do come with the free professional certification until 2025. And these courses are on some of the hot topics you want to learn about. 
artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, climate change and sustainability, software development, project management. And this is what we are trying to socialize with governments, and they are trying to push this forward to the citizens so that people can gear up for the skills of the future and they can get hold of something which is very tangible and they should go and enter the job market or the business market with certain credentials. I spoke about climate change and sustainability. By next one year, in 2025, we will be 100% running, our data centers will be 100% running on renewable energy sources. By 2030, we will be carbon negative or carbon neutral. And then there are certain other initiatives as well which are there to make sure we come across as a company who is protecting the land, who is climate friendly, and it's earth friendly as well. The last slide is something which is very important. I shared with you in the last few minutes uh, why we operate. We are here to empower every person, every organization on the planet to achieve more, as the mission says. What we do, I think I would not be able to share what we do uh, in full details. What I've just shared, the AI story, which is 10% of the overall ecosystem, right? We haven't spoken about the security component or the ERP component, workplace modernization and the gaming and, and the list of these verticals go on and on. But, what, but how we do it, I think, is something which is very fundamental and it's a differentiator, which differentiates Microsoft from any other company in the world and sets Microsoft as a benchmark to be followed. And there is a big cultural transformation I'm sure you have come across the book coming in from Satya Nadella, Hit Refresh, a few years ago in which he has shared uh, the entire philosophy behind this cultural transformation. It is the growth mindset, uh, which is empowering a lot of people to do more and create an impact. It is the core values of the company around respect, integrity, and accountability. It's the management excellence framework, which is running. And these, all these values, customer obsession, and hiring diverse and inclusive talent. This is not only happening inside the company, but it is also in the practice when we commu communicate and connect with the external audiences, our partners, our community, governments, and we are a true reflection of the culture we have. So I think our engineering efforts and product efforts and sales efforts are great, uh, but the greatest of all of these things is a culture which eats strategy for the breakfast, as they say. With this, I wish everybody good luck with the conference, and thank you for allowing me to share my part of the story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibran, and I must congratulate ITCN and um, everyone who is a part of it. Of course, Tech Destination, who partnered with the uh, e-commerce gateway, and of course, this entire event is powered by Huawei. Ladies and gentlemen, what do events of this nature do? Gibran was nice enough to actually look back and tell us and share with us that for many, ITCN captured the, the imagination and got them thinking about how IT and technology and coding can be the, the game changer. And this is the profession that they get attracted to. But I'd like to give you two examples. And I hope that you're familiar with these names. How many of you have heard of the name Khwaja Muzammil Ahmad? Anybody? Khwaja Muzammil Ahmad, you're aware of him, he was recently on my show, is a kid who's only 13, and he started coding at the age of seven. So something that was sparked by Arfa Karim back in the day is now something that, you know, the legacy carries on. Just at the age of 13, he's now become an Oracle certified professional. He's proficient in Python, in C++, in Flutter and Dart. He's independently developed numerous innovative projects, leveraging the generative AI and the Internet of Things. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the potential of Pakistan. I'll give you another example. How many of you have heard of the name Nirmala Maghani? Anybody? Nirmala Maghani is a struggling folk singer from Umar Kot in Pakistan. And for many years, this girl was unknown before her genius was discovered by the, by the pop idol Ali Zafar. And together, they have created the, the first AI-generated music video of Pakistan called Rangrasya. Take a look at it. It's a game changer. Imagine the cultural shift you're bringing for a folk singer that originates from Umar Kot. 
allowing them to visualize and dream bigger. Think of things which were considered to be impossible. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope that these tales of inspiration continue. May I now take this opportunity for inviting our next speaker. Please put your hands together to welcome um, an organization, a platform that has been a game changer for Pakistan, for Pakistani youth, be they be in the rural areas, in the far-flung areas, or the urban areas. They feel connected. It's an outlet for them to express, to be creative, and also at times monetize their creativity and report what they're good at. Please put your hands together to welcome the head of public policy programs, Middle East, Turkey, Africa, Pakistan, and South Asia, for TikTok, Ms. Zara Basharat Higgs for her address. Thank you, Sidra. Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. What a privilege to be here at the ITCN Asia today. I know that public policy program sounds like a mouthful, so I'm here today to talk to you about what is public policy programs, what are our ongoing interventions in Pakistan, and our ambitions for the market going forward. Public policy programs as a vertical works with civil society, nonprofits, academia, governments across Metapsa to address some of our region's most critical issues, from climate change to financial literacy to digital safety to access to education to building cohesion and addressing misinformation and disinformation. Our approach to public policy programs is three-pronged, and you'll see that come across in some of the examples that I will be giving you today. But the first and foremost approach is that as platform, as TikTok as a platform, we realize that we have the power to reach millions of people. But at the same time, if we're going to take on complex issues such as climate change or financial literacy, we are mindful that we're not the subject matter experts. And therefore, we partner with civil society and organizations across the region to help us design programs that are going to be long-lasting, impactful, and most importantly, relevant. The other approach is, again, with these multi-year complex issues, we realize that a one-time intervention is not going to work. So all of our policy programs are... What are the subject matter uh, you know, issues that students are really struggling with? For example, in physics, is it inertia that students have a problem understanding? So we made you know, videos on inertia. And again, this was put on the TikTok platform. We had about 550,000 video creations. By video creation, I mean when you use an existing hashtag and then students share their own exam hacks, their own view on physics, chemistry, and maths, helping far more students than we had ever imagined. To ensure the depth of the impact, by the end of this year, we would be giving out 40,000 scholarships to students across the country. When you get an exam-ready scholarship, you get access to the EdCasa platform, giving you access to tutorials, private tuition lessons on any of the subjects that you are struggling with. This program has been going on for two years, and listening to students' feedback, we've also now expanded our videos to include geography, social studies, and English grammar. And in the next year going forward, we hope to give out even more scholarships. We also partner with the Sindh Education Foundation to really help us identify who are the students that need these scholarships. Moving to the next program, uh, we also partner with the Prime Minister's Youth Loan Program um, in, a, in a problem that we thought was very interesting to solve. You had a youth loan program that, avails, well, that was available by the government, but students didn't know about it. People also thought that the application process were incredibly cumbersome and complex. So TikTok decided to take on this challenge to explain to students what does the application take and also getting female students to apply for the program. And I'm happy to share that going forward, we will be taking this into a long-term program on employability. 
With exam ready, I think you'll also be proud to know that this, this uh, program was later exported to Bangladesh. We're running this program in Bangladesh at this point. We're launching it in Nepal, and we're also launching it in Africa. So our learnings from Pakistan have been incredibly helpful in helping us design programs that have far-reaching impact across the region. Our third program, in collaboration with the Ministry of IT, with Pakistan Telecommunications Authority, and um, and Zindagi Trust is Digital Hifazat, where we've trained about 160,000 parents, teachers, and students on digital safety across 40 schools in Pakistan. This is also an ongoing project, and by the end of 2025, we, have, we, we hope to reach about 100 schools. We also learned from our programs. When we started Digital Hifazat, it was primarily focused on students, and we realized that conversations on digital safety cannot be had in isolation without involving parents and teachers and guardian, and therefore we expanded this program um, onwards. The last intervention that I want to talk to you about today is TikTok for Peace. As we're exporting policy programs from Pakistan to the region, we're also importing learnings from other parts of the region to Pakistan. TikTok for Peace is a program that we launched in Kenya, then Nigeria, then South Africa before the elections, and this program was launched in collaboration with Bildad, before the elections in Pakistan to have conversations with young people on how to build cohesion, how to have conversations with one another. I know we're all passionate, but also how to express your point of view without antagonizing each other. And we think that these are very important conversations to have. Lastly, these are some of the examples that I had for you from Pakistan. Um, the future for Pakistan from a policy program perspective is it's an incredibly important market for us. We're going to keep on expanding these programs, making sure that we're able to address and tackle some of these issues, so keep a lookout. I'm also here till the end of the day, so I know there are a lot of young people. If you have any feedback, you'd like more information about these programs, partner who'd like to collaborate, I'm happy to have this conversation. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Zara. And this is not just all uh, public policy relating to intense work. This year, I was really happy to see that TikTok also joined hand with PCB for PSL, um, the ninth season. And what it allowed them to do was actually give the cricket lovers a wonderful experience, so much so that the PSL anthem had close to about a 1 billion impressions just on TikTok in Pakistan. And about 90% of the Pakistanis who are on TikTok, in one way or the other, interacted with this. So when you have that kind of goodwill, you are able to move hearts and minds. So what Zara does specifically is using this goodwill and using this reach and these impressions for something that is going to uplift our community. Ladies and gentlemen, very recently, in June of this year, Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif was in China. And one of the few countries that he visited, one of the few companies that he visited in China, included Huawei, that is powering ITC and Asia for us. And he was very excited about the different MOUs that were signed over here, including a commitment uh, from Huawei to actually work towards training and allowing the grooming uh, abilities for about 200,000 Pakistanis. These youngsters are going to be trained in IT, specifically in AI, and this was an agreement that was signed over there. Moreover, I must also share with you that Shanghai says that 2024 is the year when the world is ready. This is going to be the first year of commercial 5.5G and the integration of AI into a wider variety of devices. Huawei is ready to share that visual uh, digitization experience with Pakistan. To hear more about the plans and how they see the potential of Pakistani youth and the country, may I now take this opportunity of, uh, for inviting the YCEO Public Affairs Huawei. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ray Yusha Yuning. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam. You just mentioned the Huawei that uh, in the June we signed the agreement for the 200,000 young people's intelligent program with the uh, uh, government. So thank you, Madam. You mentioned about that. And uh, we, Huawei launched the 5.5G. Uh, so that, uh, uh, okay. First, the uh, distinguished speakers and Mr. Munasa, USF CEO, Mr. Zohim, Chairman Pasha, 
I'm Brigadier Nadia, SFC IT and the Telecom. Mr. Zhashen, I'm the P, uh, PS, P, Mr. Ahem from IT Sing Asia. Mr. Jibrin, Chemish Microsoft. And Dr. Kushid, uh, Commerce Gateway. So thank you. Uh, today I'm very happy to stand here to give the speech. I show my experience about the the how the ICT is developed in Pakistan. So to, today I want to talk about the cloud. So I think that the cloud, the age of the Pakistan is arrived. Uh, I come to Pakistan in 2021. So that time, uh, it's a COVID-19 the time. So I most uh, is only stay in my house and uh, office in these two points. So that time, mostly that after the work, I do the everything online, get to the food, have the video conference, and uh, get to the social media that get to the information. So every day, the, I, my life align on the online, the all the kind of service. But after the two years, the, that COVID-19 is finished, but, uh, but the people's life is come the normal. But the internet, the throughput still increase because this habit already be here. So that that means that in the future that uh, the, the Pakistan the international internet requirement increase very quickly, very quickly. So today, in Pakistan we have uh, 240 million uh, population, but uh, we have uh, nine, 193 million mobile subscribers, and in this uh, part. The 4G subscriber, 4G mobile the users is around uh, 110 million. So that means more than 50%, it's 58% uh, uh, users, they have a smartphone. They have a smartphone. And for the fixed network that I see the, for the broadband, for the past three years, every year the users increased uh, more than 97%. So that means what? Means every people need the internet. Every people like to use the, the data. So I see the some signal this year. Firstly, every customer ask me about the data center. Every customer talk about uh, talk uh, the, the, the the hot topic with me is about how to provide a better cloud service to the people. So that uh, I feeling that uh, this mode requirement come from the customer. That's why now the government encourages the, the, the third party, the company, the investor to build the data center and the cloud service. I want to share that uh, three stories uh, with us. So firstly, in the 2021, Huawei got the uh, win the project from the China grant project for the e-classroom. After two years, 2023, we launched the 100 e-classroom in 50 university. So this year, I visit one U this e-classroom. Uh, e I see that it's a very great job for the U students because I see the professor stand on the stage and give the course to the student. But online, there is a four or five university people, the students still online to join this course. So these students, any time they can interaction with the professor, they can read the questions, they can go to the answers, they can like the, in the real classroom to learn the, these technologies. So that the good professor can give the very good benefit to the students. So that can make the, the interesting, the students can very convenient, very easy to get the service from, uh, get the good course from the, any university and uh, from the, any professor. So in the future, if these clouds develop again, what will happen? Even that uh, the students, how many students really in the, this classroom will focus, focus on their that, uh, content, focus on their teachers? H how the teachers give the good, the, give the, good the, the, the course, the, the uh, speech? That uh, is AI can analyze if the they can, after one year, we can collect the more data to analyze this school is the best or the not, not the best. The student has a good uh, 
education or not, which course will be more, most welcome to students or not. So AI can do a lot of things that can happen on the cloud. This is the first story. Second one is about the smart uh, village. Uh, also from the 2021, that uh, we got a job to build the smart village with the corporate, with the USF, with the IT ministry. Uh, so that time Huawei prepared, the, we uh, located the, the Gokina. Uh, it's a 35 kilometer nearby the uh, Islamabad. This village, we built a smart village. After two years, that uh, we launched that smart village. That uh, here, I want to thank uh, to show my thanks to the USF, Mr. Mudasa. USF did a very good job, did a very good job to give the good coverage to the rural area. Give it to the rural area. Let the people in the rural area have the right to get access to the internet, get, get the multiple service from the internet. So we go to the Gokina, even we go to the one clinic, small clinic in the, in the mountain. That clinic coverage around 3,500 people there. These people, if no clinic, they never go to the hospital. If they have a little pain, a little ease, ease uh, some, some sick, but they won't to spend a long time to go to the hospital. If the, we have so many kind of this kind of the clinic, what will happen? We benefit to the people in the rural area. In the future, let's see what we want to do. We want to connect all of this kind of clinic to the hospital, to the first primary hospital, to the secondary hospital, make all of this kind of hospital has one data, data center and has one day, uh, that share the data of the patients. So if this kind of thing is done, what will happen? That if one patient in the one hospital, they have some uh, problem, they scan their lens, but they cannot resolve the problem, they go to another hospital, but they can directly to share, download the, this, uh, the, the imaging. No need to spend the money. That saves the money for the patient. Saves the money for the patient. The hospital will know what the history of the patient happened. So that will be more, make it more easy to the doctor to judge how to, to give the diagnosis to, the, to this patient. So that uh, is how the ICT digitalization to facilitate the people, to facilitate the people. So yesterday I landed from Iceland but to Karachi. So I know that Karachi is a very big city, very beautiful city. I know Karachi has a very good food and uh, that's a very, very famous city. But uh, Karachi don't know me. Why? Because uh, Karachi don't have the enough data about the people. What is the smart city? Smart city means that when you have the enough data of the, all the people, the city will be more friendly, more facility to the people. So when in the future, if we have the good data of the people can provide the best service to the people, when I land to the Karachi, the city know me, the city recognize me, the city can provide the best service to me. So this is what we want to do what we want to provide the, our best effort to facilitate this uh, to the people. The third story is about uh, that uh, in the Shenzhen. Uh, three years before I worked in China, in Shenzhen. So that time that the Shenzhen government, they, built the, they spent the $1 billion to build the intelligence data center, intelligence computing center. Uh, they built a very huge data center, has a good uh, ability, but uh, actually government don't no need to use so big a resource. What they do? They want to provide this kind of the computing resource to the people, to the enterprise, to the small enterprise in the Shenzhen. So you know Shenzhen has a very lot of the company, good company in the Shenzhen, like the Huawei, like the Dajiang, like the Tencent, but still has a thousand, ten thousand uh, small, com small company, there are maybe two or three young people, they develop, this just the start. But if they have a very good resource from the government, use a cheap price to convert the resource of the computing, the AI, they can develop more. So 
I'm very thanks to the government. Now the Pakistan government also do the same things. Another thing is the Huawei we also do is we are give the training of the, the, the young people. So we want to also, based on our that, uh, the, the efforts, we want to let the more students, more young people to have the ability, to have the interest in to join this kind of the industry. Maybe in the future, that uh, the Pakistan also has a lot of the, some good company that uh, I just mentioned that uh, 4G subscriber has a uh, 110 million. If any apps in the three or four years they can develop has uh, more than that uh, 20, 30 million subscribers, that uh, will be a very good company. So this is uh, what we do, why we will do our effort to digitalization to give this, uh, our effort to our customer and our partner. So to support the ICT to develop. So the that's, uh, that's why the, uh, that's, uh, the cloud the age is come. So thank you. OK. Thank you so much, Mr. Ray. And again, referring to the Prime Minister's visit to the Huawei headquarters back in June this year, again, uh, it was emphasized that Huawei was invited by the Honorable Prime Minister to actually invest in Pakistan's safe city, taxation, and the e-governance sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, as we move forward with the inaugural session, I'm very happy to see so many women here. How many women um, are actually sitting in the audience? And if you can just raise your cell phones to let me know that you're here. Jahan is raising hers. Can I see a lot of women do that? Would you be actually grateful for this uh, facility that you have? Because as per the latest data, 50% of women in Pakistan do not have a cell phone, compared to 81% men. So. I, I think that's a ratio, that's a gap that we are working towards closing. It's equivalent to saying that 22 million fewer women than men own a mobile phone. Women in Pakistan are about 49% less likely to use mobile internet than men, which translates into that 12 million fewer women than men use the mobile phone. As per the PTA this year, 122.9 million mobile broadband subscriptions are uh, actually out there in the country. Out of this, only 29 million are women subscriptions. So there's a huge gap. But the good news is that, that the GCMA reported Pakistan is one country where the gender gap in mobile internet usage is reducing, unlike India and Bangladesh. Tremendous efforts by several organizations and NGOs are behind this. UNDP is working very closely with a number of organizations. So it opens up so many doors, brings in diversity, brings in inclusion for women entrepreneurs. But someone who's been a beacon and perhaps one of the few women, one of the pioneering women uh, in, uh, in terms of women in tech in Pakistan is amongst us. Today, she is also the founder and CEO of Catalyst Labs. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Madam Jiha Ara. Thank you, Sidra. First of all, congratulations to ITCN on its 25th anniversary. I just can't believe it. I was at the very first ITCN, and now we stand here today at the 25th anniversary. Congratulations to Dr. Khurshid Nizam, Omer Nizam, the whole team at ITCN. I think this is great. It brings us all together. There are many people I don't meet throughout the year whom I meet at ITCN. So it's just great that you have enabled this. OK, so Sidra has started something that I'm going to continue with. There's been a lot of talk about a lot of subjects. And so I'm not going to repeat that. And I told Gibran that I will definitely not talk about AI. So <laughs> I'm going to keep my word. I'm going to touch on the aspect of women. I remember when I joined the tech sector in Pakistan, I think I was one of probably a couple of women who were part of the tech sector. It was predominantly male, and there didn't seem to be any scope for women starting companies, women joining companies, 
women being on the board of companies, and that was something that bothered me. I didn't see why that was. And it started, I think, with, you know, your families tell you these are professions that are women-friendly. Your university or your school tells you this is not for women. And then you go into companies and they tell you, OK, you can go up to maybe mid-management level and no further. Because women are not supposed to be CEOs or board directors. But why? This country is 50% women. And some of the smartest people in the country are women. By not using their capabilities, by not involving them, we are doing this country a disservice. And that is something I strongly believe. So I started, you know, my history with Pasha, but three and a half years ago, I started Catalyst Labs. And the main mission of Catalyst Labs was to build women leadership and to make sure that women created business networks for themselves, to make sure that they understood that there was a role for them wherever they wanted that role to be. We don't tell them that. They have to decide. What are they passionate about? What is, they, what is it that they want to do in life? How can we help them get there? So three and a half years down the road, I'm happy to tell you we have met some of the most amazing women in the country who are doing great things. They keep a low profile and so people don't hear about them, but we are helping them change that. We are also working with Visa. Visa started a program called She's Next, and that actually says what they meant. They meant that women entrepreneurs are the next big thing. And that program was so successful that the Visa regional team decided that we needed to do an additional program called She's the Future, 100 women, to help them get to the next level of growth. And these women are not just from Karachi. They're from seven different cities across Pakistan. And this is just the beginning. So we're working with women in Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, Faisalabad, Hyderabad, and there's one other, Peshawar. And, you know, it's amazing what they have been able to do, and it's amazing what they will do now that they have the support, and now that they know that there are other women in Pakistan who have done great work. Some of them people hadn't heard of. So we make sure we connect them with women who have achieved something. We also connect them with male champions who are helping women get to the level where they can and where these people recognize they can. As far as IT companies are concerned, I think they have also realized that if they have women within their ranks, especially on the boards of their companies, they will see that the products and services that they produce are actually for a wider market, not just locally, but also globally. And so those companies that have done that have benefited. I also work with an organization called Women for Boards. And the whole idea is that, OK, so now women have become CEOs, or women have gone into senior leadership in companies, but they should also be on the board of companies. SECP has mandated that public listed companies should have at least one woman on the board, or two now, I think they've done. So, if you're a public listed company, you need to have two women on the board. And they should not be part of your family. They should not just be token women. They need to be women professionals who contribute to the growth of the company. And that is just amazing. In fact, it shouldn't be limited to two. It isn't limited, but they've said minimum should be two. But I think they should increase that number. And what Women for Boards has done is that they have published a directory. Because you know what happens when people are told, you know, companies are told, make sure you have at least two women on your board. They say, well, they don't exist. Where do we find them? And so Women for Boards has said, here's a directory of 100 women who are both professional, they are qualified, and they are board material. They have passed the PICG exam, which makes them qualified to be on your board. So now, look at them, and they are from different professions. IT, education, healthcare, you name it. 
so there's no longer any excuse. So I'm glad people are working on different programs to make sure that diversity and inclusion becomes a real thing. The second thing I want to talk about is policy. All of us know what has happened during the past couple of weeks. Our internet slowed down, our inability to use WhatsApp or any of the other apps has made it very difficult for us, both as an IT sector as well as a startup ecosystem, to communicate with the world. In addition to causing the problems it did for us, it also causes problems to our image. Why do you think anybody would want to work with a country where they don't know when your internet will be turned off or slowed down? This is something I think all of us need to work with policymakers to make sure that they understand the impact that this has on our business, on the country's business, and also on the country's economy. This is something that has affected a lot of startups. It's affected a lot of tech companies. And you know, product demos, they couldn't uh, make sure that they dealt with potential customers online because the internet was not fast enough for them to do that. So I think these are things I understand security, and I understand that's an issue. But I think if policymakers work with those of us who work in the tech sector and the startup ecosystem to make sure that the steps that they take are transparent and also that are beneficial for the country, but also don't harm the interests of business. This is very important if we are to grow this economy. The tech sector is the largest sector contributing to the economy right now, but that will not remain unless we address these issues. And so I wanted to talk about it because it is an issue, it is a problem, and we need to solve it collectively. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. It's great to be back at ITCN, and hopefully we will meet as we go and see uh, some of the booths during the day. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, ITCN, for inviting me. Thank you so much, Jehan. And uh, it's a pleasure to hear from you. And thank you for calling a spade a spade. Uh, there's so many things that require us to perhaps look at things differently. The government's role over here, and perhaps also as have been acknowledged, I think one of the key contributors and now stakeholders can be the SIFC that highlights the IT professionals and IT industry and their role as enablers, ensuring that the Pakistani stakeholders, the professionals, the IT organizations get the right kind of environment to truly achieve their potential is commendable. But one of the things we also want to touch upon is how IT and technology is changing the way we want to work and the way we look at life. And um, perhaps, uh, you know, as we have mentors and our next speaker, Rehan Bhai, is someone who propagates about wellness and uh, maintaining that, yes, you have a potential, you should strive towards excellence, but at the same time, the work-life balance is extremely important. I thought that that could be a very relevant theme uh, to today's uh, event as well. Do you know that very recently in Australia, and this was quite a stir yesterday online, according to the new legislation passed by the Australian government, people can now refuse to monitor read and respond to their employer's attempt to contact them outside of work hours. So no emails, no WhatsApp messages would go through. Do we need something of that or is it a first world problem? Because in Pakistan, we believe that we have a job to do it. So let's uh, put all of those themes together. But ladies and gentlemen, IT and technology is a true game changer, allowing many to live up to their dreams. Please join me in welcoming our next keynote speaker, who can perhaps bridge the gap, who can talk about the best practices around the world and how they see the Pakistani potential. Please join me in welcoming the president of the Overseas Investors Chamber of Commerce and Industry, commonly known as the OICCI, and also the CEO of Standard Chartered Pakistan, Mr. Rehan Sheikh. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ماشاء اللہ اتنا بز ہے اینڈ جسٹ این ایکسٹریملی وام ویلکم اینڈ تھینک یو فار انوائٹنگ می ہیئر ان مائی کیپیسٹی ایز دی او آئی سی سی آئی چیف پریزیڈنٹ آئی ایم ویئرنگ ٹو ہیٹس آئی ایم آلسو دی چیف ایگزیکٹو فار اسٹینڈرڈ چارٹرڈ بینک جہانا نے ایک بہت اچھا ٹون سیٹ کیا ہے اور وہ ٹون ہے انکلوسیوٹی کا وہ ٹون ہے فاؤنڈیشن کا دا ٹون از ایکچولی اباؤٹ ہاؤ ڈو وی ورک ٹوگیدر ٹو کریٹ این ایکو سسٹم آٹ واٹ وی وانٹ ٹو ڈو اینڈ آئی ایم ویری ویری گریٹ فل فار دی آرگنائزرس ٹو انوائٹ می ہیئر بیکاز اٹس امپارٹنٹ فار یو ٹو ہیو دا پرسپیکٹو دیٹ آئی ایم گوئنگ ٹو ٹرائی ٹو برنگ فرام این او آئی سی سی آئی پرسپیکٹو Not many people know what OICCI is all about, but let me just take a couple of minutes to let you know what, what we do and what is OICCI's main objectives are. And how is it relevant to the different sectors that we operate in, and more importantly, the IT sector. As you know, uh, the investment that, that comes in, it actually creates uh, a lot of Uh, opportunities, not just uh, uh, manufacturing, not just export, but also creating a, a platform to create employment for our youth. And that is exactly what we try to do with the 200 plus members that we have on the OICCI platform. MashaAllah, the, uh, aap ye dekhen ke, uh, jo 200 member hain, ye takriban uh, 31 countries se represent hote hain Pakistan ke andar. There are 14 key sectors that we operate in. Just in the last decade alone, there was an investment of about $22 billion dollars that came in through these companies that are, that are operating in different sectors of the economy. What we do is basically in terms of the advocacy that we have with the government of Pakistan, key stakeholders, to ensure that the policy formulation that needs to be done, it is part and parcel of how we conduct the business easing ease of business and there is no other area that has huge other uh, big potential is the IT sector because what it will do it will help create employment it will cre help create uh, uh, exports for us and more importantly your technology transfer it through the MNCs that actually comes here so I'm very proud to say that these 200 court companies uh, are doing their, uh, their, their part, but we, the challenges are actually quite immense. I'm not here, especially when so many con uh, uh, industry experts are sitting here. So what do we need? We need a sustainable environment. We need a platform that actually helps us to put those policies and strategy together. And as you know, the IT framework is the backbone of any business. If there is no uh, 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 infrastructure, if there is no innovation, if there is no stability in the IT structure that any company has or any country has, it becomes very difficult for it to sustain. So what we've seen, I think Jahara mentioned about, uh, about uh, uh, mobiles. Jahara mentioned about what we've seen. Har, har itni kharab nahi hai. Uh, the kind of technology investment that we've seen in the mobile sector, Uh, the kind of things that we are doing now happening on the ground. It's really quite, quite uh, encouraging to see the widespread innovation uh, environment that is getting, uh, getting uh, uh, initiated. There is no reason why we cannot have a Poland. There's no reason why we cannot have a Kuala Lumpur. There's no reason why we cannot have a Chennai as a center of excellence in Pakistan. But what would that require? It requires creating an ecosystem. It, it requires creating A, a skilled labor force. It requires creating an infrastructure on the technology uh, power sector so that these gaps are, investors go, what do we tell? How do we attract FDI? The only way we can attract FDI is that we have a level playing field with other uh, countries that are competing in this space. So I'm quite happy that uh, the way this uh, uh, IT sector has been growing 20 to 30 percent over the last few years, it's something that we are quite encouraged as we go forward. A, a few facts. Pakistan actually ranks 109th in terms of 2023 IT Global Knowledge Index. What does that mean? It means that there is room for people to acquire the skills. What will that do? It will tell multinationals like mine, 
multinationals of the uh, uh, other 200 entities, that there is a, an opportunity for you to put your contracts in a country like Pakistan. But how will it come when there sustainability? Aegi. IT professionals, ki, uh, uh, university graduates ho, ya skilled labor, ho. I think somebody mentioned about a child, seven year old, uh, now 13. I know a child in, in the US who's going to college at the, air, year, at the age of 12. He's registered in NYU. He's a Bangladeshi uh, kid, uh, right now living in Long Island, New York. He's going to NYU at the age of 12. And, and Sidra, he is a, a remarkable uh, individual. But there are such examples, alhamdulillah, that we also find in Pakistan. How do we encourage that? How do we bring them forward through these forums? And I would also encourage uh, you know, the organizers, if they can put up a separate area or a, a session for the youth who's coming in, not just the invent, in, investors, but also who can come in. So my, my request is that from, from uh, the platform that I want to use here is that you're not alone. Uh, you're not alone. You have a, a representation from the biggest chamber in Pakistan. Uh, you have a representation of 200 companies who are giving contracts out to these IT professionals, IT uh, companies. And it's just not the professionals. When, when a big market like Pakistan with 250 million people, that's where the mobile companies are. That's where the technology companies are. That's where the center of excellence companies are. Some of these entities are doing a remarkable job, and we are actually quite encouraged to take that forward. A bit more facts. My, uh, the, the studies that I have seen, um, there is a potential to do IT and IT exports in the region of 10 to 18 billion dollars by 2030. And this is, uh, you know, adds another 35 billion dollars to our GDP. But this cannot be done alone. It cannot be done by, by, by representations from the government. It has to be done by a public private partnership. We at OICCI believe in that. I think uh, uh, you, you mentioned something about, about sustainability. If you do not have the ecosystem on, uh, on sustainability, and, and climate, there is, there is very limited opportunity for those companies to look at us because our exports have to be uh, com uh, compatible into the international standards. So it's an ecosystem where we feel that SME, agriculture uh, are, are, are great areas where we can add in terms of the uh, improving on the environment and as we go forward. One of the good examples that are there is uh, uh, Governor Saab Yampe Nahi hai. But uh, I think, see, Suhail Saab is sitting there. Suhail Saab is the architect of why I, I didn't know that he's going to be here. But if, I, if you ask me, this individual, this gentleman, is the architect of the transformation of technology that has taken place in the banking sector. So I want to give everybody to give him a good round of applause. You know, we've got five digital banks now. The, the, you know, it, it was unheard of opening accounts to the facial recognition and through the technology platform. Things like Russian digital account, things like RAST, what we work with the central bank, it is commendable that, they, that what the banks have achieved. Why? This is to create financial inclusion. This is to create what, what Jahara was talking about, women that needs to be brought into the workforce by, by doing uh, you know, businesses from their home. So uh, with, the, with the help of the central bank, the IT ministry, and, and you all, we are quite confident that, inshallah, there is, a, there is a future out there. Pakistan has all the right ingredients. It has the manpower. It, has, it needs to build the infrastructure. And companies like us or forums like these will actually help us to go forward. I hope. I hope this, uh, this uh, uh, conference, this uh, uh, event that we've organized, the organizers actually get uh, to create the traction that we're looking for. And uh, I wish you all the best. And if there's anything that on the platform of OICCI that your 25-year uh, uh, you know, sessions that can facilitate, we, please look at us and, and wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Reham Bhai, and it is heartening to have the support of the biggest chamber of Pakistan behind us. I believe there's a cell phone here. Reham Bhai, is this yours?
Ladies and gentlemen, there are tons of things that go wrong, and just like today's event is testament to the fact that Pakistanis believe that the show must go on. No matter what direction the wind blows, we adjust our sails and we reach our destination. And more importantly, it is our wonderful sense of humor that at times gets us by. All the things that depress generally people around the world, we try to take a light of it. And that is why Pakistan, and specifically Karachi, is also known as the meme capital of the world. So at times, one of the best things that I see is that you get to see somebody's very stark side, and then immediately they take a 180 degree shift. And locally, we call it, iska software update ho gaya. So um, somebody who can perhaps com comment more on the so software updation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our next speaker. He is, of course, the chief executive officer of the Pakistan Software Export Board, the PSEB. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Zeeshan Khatak. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, SIFC, uh, Madam Jahara, Chairman Pasha, uh, uh, ITCN, uh, Uzair Saab, and all. Um, good afternoon and Assalamu alaikum. Software, uh, inshallah, we, we have all, all the right ingredients. So we are looking for the pill. Inshallah, we will be there. Um, uh, so s there are a few things that I heard, like Madam Jahara just said uh, about uh, women uh, on the boards. So not only SCCP, the number is actually not two, it's one third. So the larger the board is, the more women can be put. And then there is new SOE Act, which allows women to be on the board of uh, public uh, organizations as well. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, IITCN and Omer Nizam for this amazing event and the, the, the consistency that he has shown all through these years. And, and most of it, actually, uh, we as PSCB were partner to it. Uh, what uh, our philosophy with these events is that uh, we, as PSCB, we take um, our software producers, the service providers globally as well. Magar, given the kind of uh, funds that we have, we can only take a limited amount of people, limited companies abroad. With events such as these, uh, it helps us bring the rest of the world to Pakistan. Uh, Alam Iqbal uh, said that Jazmbae baham jo nahi, mehfile anjom bhi nahi. So it's very important for us Pakistanis and our IT companies to ensure that events like these are successful. Uh, what that means is that our foreign clients, our uh, prestigious clients, we bring them here as well uh, and, and to give them that image of Pakistan. Um, uh, the, the country has amazing potential. Uh, and it, uh, uh, somebody just said about uh, software updation. So, Walam Iqbal ke core share is that the Lord will not be able to do anything that you will not be able to do anything. A lot of times we get our momentum in life, in personal life, through these periods. And, and it makes us better people, better companies, and better societies. Pakistan Software Export Board, we do advocacy for the IT industry at every level. We, we have programs, uh, skill programs, we have infrastructure programs, we have marketing programs, and we look for opportunities such as these to showcase our IT companies, products, and services locally and globally as well. Um, again, I, would, uh, I really appreciate these, and uh, PSEB is always there at your service. Um, we see a lot of uh, potential here, and we want the rest of the world to see this potential as well. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, I'll again end with Alam Iqbal who said that zara nam ho to is a bhot zarkhez hai ye mati saaki. So thank you very much, and Pakistan Sindhava. Thank you, Zeeshan Saab. I think you were referring to Zara Namho to ye mitti badi zarkhez hai saaki. Lekin jo aapne dousra share kaha aur usko milaya software updation se to khuda tujhe kisi aise tufaan se naash na hi rakhe. Kyunki wo bada mushkil marhala ho sakta hai. Ladies and gentlemen, as we move forward, this indeed is a 
is it the age of awareness and the age of attention? What grabs your attention and what allows you to imagine the unimaginable is something that is going to push us forward. I think another theme that is very relevant for Pakistan is sustainability and climate change and how technology can play a part in it. When we look at our country, we are perhaps one of the most vulnerable countries and therefore it is really important that we take an overview of how we are running our businesses, how our lifestyle is run, how we maintain our food security for being the fourth or the fifth largest, the most populous country of the world. Technology can play a huge role. And while we are talking about B2B and coding and artificial intelligence, it is really the farmers and the miners and the people of Pakistan who do blue collar jobs who can really benefit from all of this. And they can really benefit from the new technologies and become aware of how they can use these to their advantage. There is a huge potential out there, and I'm sure that when it comes to having access to finance, having access to the ability to do so, just yesterday, uh, the tractors in Pakistan have become more expensive. And that's like a very rudimentary uh, technology when it comes, when you look at the larger scheme of things. So how is this world, how is this ecosystem benefiting the common man, his ecosystem, his home, his neighborhood, his farm, his field, is the real question before us all. And ladies and gentlemen, to tackle some of these larger themes, may I now request our next speaker to please come in and um, you know, give a talk about that. He is, of course, our also, uh, he's also our guest of honor. Please join me in welcoming the Executive Director for Digital Financial Services Group at the State Bank of Pakistan, Sayyid Suhail Jawad Sahab. Bismillah rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, ITCN for giving me an opportunity to present some of the advancements that we are seeing in Pakistan, especially in the area of banking and payments. I am also thankful to Rehan Saab for the kind words, uh, Madam Jahan Ara, Khatak Saab, and all the others, and Umair uh, for inviting me here. I have got a few slides for you because I, I know it's very difficult to focus on what one is saying, and especially if it's in a foreign language. So uh, let's start with the presentation that I have here. If you go to the next slide. <clears throat> in 2019, State Bank launched its national payment system strategy. And in that strategy, we committed that we'll be doing, we'll be taking some steps to broaden the reach of digital financial services to the, to the common people. And as you can see, there are six uh, pillars or six uh, cogs for, the, uh, for this uh, national strategy wheel. One, we said we'll upgrade our payment systems, digital payment systems. Second, we said we will upgrade the retail payment systems. We will digitize those retail payment systems. We will focus on remittances. We will focus on digitizing government. We will focus on improving our own capacity to regulate and oversee these payment systems. Because if we don't uh, bring trust into these payment systems, people will not uh, use them. And finally, we also said that we will upgrade our regulatory infrastructure because we were feeling that banks are not enough. Banks may not be enough to offer their services. We need to have more than the banks. And the trend that was very evident by that time was that fintechs and new techs and big techs uh, should be part of the financial system. So that's what we committed. So if you go to the next slide, five years down the road, where are we today? So if you look at the entire digital payment systems, you see there are institutions that offer payment services. There are instruments like apps and cards that are available. And there are centralized infrastructures, we call them payment system operators, who process those transactions. So today in Pakistan, and I think Pakistan is, mashallah, very lucky in this regard, we've got two main systems. One is our real-time gross settlement system, which is called PRISM, and the other is RAST, which we recently launched. 
and both these systems are built on ISO 20 or 22 standard. And I, in a short while, I'll talk about why ISO is so important and why it's important for our IT industry to focus on ISO 20 or 22 uh, standard. We have got a number of payment systems operators today. We've got one link who operates uh, IBFT and who interconnects all the ATMs and who offers bill payment services. We have got uh, VRG, who is the operator of Asan mobile accounts. We have got uh, Payfast, who is now emerging as a new uh, merchant aggregator. Of course, NIFT is there for check uh, payments. We also have, of course, banks and uh, EMIs. Uh, I, um, I'm glad to observe and uh, report that there are four EMIs who have been licensed by State Bank, and two of them are really, really doing, in fact, three of them are really great, doing some uh, good jobs. If you go to the next slide, you see that we have almost around 19,000 uh, ATMs today. Uh, in 2019, we had about 40,000 POS point of sale machines. They are very expensive machines used with cards. Today we have uh, more than 125,000 machines. Uh, we have got almost 100,000 merchants who accept digital payments through cards. And I think one area where we need to focus on, and I'll really talk about that, is the growing e-commerce. So e-commerce has now moving from cash on delivery to digital payments. So we have almost 8,000 e-merchants who accept uh, these, and these include bigger merchants and aggregators also. And we have a new area where merchants are now deploying QR codes. So more than 500,000 merchants have deployed QR codes where you can scan a QR code and make a payment, a dream of many of our, of our uh, people. If we go to the, and then we also have branchless banking. We have more than 600,000 branchless banking outlets, so you can walk into a shop and conduct transactions there, but these are mostly cash in, cash out transactions. If you go to the next slide, let's see where we stand today in terms of usage. And I think this is very important. We should be, we must be very proud of the progress that we have made in this one particular area. So we've got around 203 million total accounts in the country. So these includes accounts and wallets and branchless banking wallets and corporate accounts. And out of them, almost 88 million are unique accounts, which means that there are 88 million end users, uh, individuals, or corporates who either have an account or a, or a wallet. Now, why this is important? It's important because to do a transaction digitally, you need to either have an account or a wallet or some sort of a uh, unit where you can hold value. We have got about, if you look at the left side, you will see there are about 59 million branchless banking wallets that have been created. Now, I'll not say that all these are being used or active, but 59 million branchless banking wallets that could either be used through using USSD or apps are there. And another 19 million banks apps. So these are apps that are uh, issued by banks. They are there. And you can see that there is an annual growth rate of 16% into on the users of these apps, which is quite healthy. And I think it must be one of the largest uh, in the world also. Uh, we've got about 12 million internet banking portals. So people who log on to their portal, to a bank's website, or and conduct transactions. And there are another 3.7 million e-wallet users. These are issued by uh, EMIs. And the age profile of these users are mostly young boys and girls who study in universities or colleges and they are using it. Of course, the transaction size is very small. And another thing is that 95% of the transactions that are conducted using EMI wallets are actually end-to-end -end digital. They don't get cashed out, so which is another healthy sign. So I'm very, very hopeful that the EMIs uh, are doing a good job. If you look at the next slide, and I think that's also very important. This shows the transactional trends starting 2019 when we, uh, when we announced our strategy and today. So if you look on the, on the top left, you will see that in FY20, 55% of all uh, retail transactions were done digitally, either through wallets or uh, through apps. Today, that number has risen up to 84% by volume. So 84% transactions that are done using accounts or wallets are actually done digitally in Pakistan. 
But if you look at on the on the on in the uh, lower panel, you will see that by in terms of value, that is the ratio is reverse. So today, 83 percent of uh, our transactions by value value in PKR terms are actually done using checks or or cash. <coughs> Uh, that's the ch that's the challenge that we need to address. How we convert those uh, big value transactions to uh, to uh, to digital? And of course, there are real estate transactions. There are transactions relating to B two B supply chain, and some of the other areas which are still uh, they needs to be digitized. And I'll I'll briefly talk about what we are doing about that. Uh, Sidra, please stop me whenever you want to. Uh, I know I can go on and on with this thing. Now, on the right side, if you see, this is the growth, year-on-year -year growth. So where we were in FY23 and where we are in FY24. So I think one of the healthy trends, again, is the use of mobile bank applications and the transactions that are done using mobile banking apps. And I think this is almost uh, doubling uh, every year. Uh, internet banking portals are also rising, but the rise is not as much as mobile banking. And like I said, e-wallets are also being used. So the bottom line is, yes, we are making progress. And mashallah, this is good news. But we need to do more. And I also think, if you, if you look at the next slide, I, I actually, when I was thinking about it, I wrote down these two, two, two statements. I said, I think in Pakistan, digital payments and, and uh, banking, the supply side problem has been resolved to a much larger extent. So we can say that we are at the stage where I think India was in 2013 or 14 when they did the, uh, when they safely did the demonetization because their digital sector was ready to support the, the businesses. But again, in Pakistan, adoption is still a big challenge. I mean, people, especially businesses and SMEs, merchants who would go and use and accept digital payments. So these are our challenges. So if you go to the next slide, there are about 5 million SMEs. Now, this is, I think, a, a two or three years old number. But 5 million SMEs. And how many merchants, I said, who are accepting card payments? Only 100,000, around 100,000. And another maybe add 400,000 who are willing to use digital payments. But we think that P2P is increasingly being used at shops. If you go to a shop and ask them that, you do you accept? Uh, Easy Pesa or Jazz Cash, I think many of them would say, yes, we do accept. And with Rast, you can actually ask for their mobile number and key that number into your app, and it will show you the number, uh, the account number of the person. So usually P2P, a lot of that is also happening on, on stores. So if you go to the next slide, and I'll take a segue here. So here comes my favorite Rast, and which is, of course, Fari, free and Asan, and of course, uh, I, I put this slide here to, 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 to demonstrate a point that we are focusing on women, we are focusing on young uh, people, and we are focusing on the use cases that these people use. Pakistan is a predominantly uh, young country. Uh, of course, like Jahara said, 50% are women, and they have got uh, mobility and accessibility issues. So I, we, we sincerely believe that RAS can solve those problems. So if you go to the next slide. So R what is RAS? Of course, I'm sure many of you knows it's a payment platform. It's instant, for e free, and all that. But what's most important, if you look at the next slide, it's built on a standard called ISO 20 or 22. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, ISO 20 or 22 is a global standard world is moving. The payments are now moving from uh, the olden card basis uh, standard, which was 8583 to ISO 2022. And if you look at the next slide, it will show you the adoption. How many countries? Uh, this is just a few countries, but I think most of the countries, especially advanced countries, are now moving towards adopting ISO 22. So why ISO 20 or 22? I personally think this standard is critical for our businesses. I think our businesses need to move forward from the REST APIs that they are using for integration and move towards incorporating the ISO 20 or 22 APIs into their systems. It gives access to huge data. And our friend from Huawei was talking about the lack of data that we have. And I think this will solve the data problem that we have because ISO 20 or 22 allows you to capture a lot of data items about the customers. 
Second, it allows you to pre-val a transaction, and it allows you, any business, to make sure that the payment that they are making will actually be made. It, it, there are very few chances that it would be rejected, <coughs> and I think that's a very important point for the business to know that their payments will not be instant, but it will be, <coughs> excuse me, it would be actually be committed as uh, agreed and, uh, into the contract. Of course, it's, I think ISO 2022 is a road map will lead to the adoption of CBDC in Pakistan. Many people talk about central bank digital currencies and say why is state bank not doing anything about it or why is the government not doing about it, anything about it. We have been working on CBDC assessment for the past few years. And what we have concluded in state bank is that we may, the economy may not be ready for the huge investment of CBDC because right now we have RAST and we are, we are facing a lot of challenges in adoption there, especially from our business side, who seems to be so fixated on the taxation issues, which is like, a, I think that's, that's a very uh, short term view. But uh, once we adopt the ISO 2022 standard, I think that would lead our economy to the adoption of CBDC, which is extremely critical. Uh, distributed assets and distributed businesses are going to be the future. Sometime else, maybe I can talk about that. Uh, if you go to the next slide, so we all know uh, RAST has three use cases, bulk is for corporates, P2P is for sending payments to each other, and then of course the most recent P2M is there. And if you go to the next slide, you will see that in RAS, we've got more than 33, 35, I think, uh, participants now. Good thing is that participants from the uh, equity side are using it uh, fairly well. Uh, CDC ha is, is doing a remarkable job in ensuring that asset management companies and stock exchange settlements also take place through RAS. The other very encouraging thing is that we are now processing 90% of government salaries from Islamabad uh, through RAST, which is, I think, a big, big, we faced initial, initially we faced a lot of challenge there, but now uh, we are getting uh, requests from all the provincial governments and our taxation authorities that they want to uh, move towards RAST, because once they, they know that they, once they design the whole interface and the integration, that, that makes it more easier. So we have got more than 38 million RAST IDs today, which means there are 38 million people who have some sort of a RAST ID which they can use to accept payments. Uh, since its start, we have uh, almost uh, conducted 728, I think 729 million today, 729 million transactions on RAST, valuing over 17 trillion rupees. And daily on the average, we do around, we process around 2.5 million transactions. Uh, uh, the value is almost 50 billion PKR or 60 billion PKR. I think it's way less than where we should be. I think we should be doing, uh, as of today, we should be doing 5 million transactions in Pakistan because we look at other comparable systems also around the world. So we need to do a bit better on this. Uh, next, very quickly, RAST P2M. It offers the merchants to accept payments using QR codes. It offers merchants uh, uh, to send a request to pay. So a merchant can actually send me, if I go and buy something, they can send me a request to pay and I can say yes and they get paid. Now, a request to pay is of two types. You can choose to pay immediately or you can defer the payment. So bill payments and e-commerce payments can be done. I think this request to pay is very, very critical for e-commerce industry in Pakistan. I think it's very important that the e-commerce players now start asking for RAST inter integration for their uh, e-commerce payments. We are also introducing a new category of service providers in Pakistan, and they are called PISPs, Payment Initiation Service Providers. These are going to be third-party fintechs who offer services for their customers, and they would be able to send a request to their customers' banks for making a payment. And this is a very uh, complex product also, comprehensive. We recently concluded a sandbox with one of the fintechs uh, in State Bank to see how it will work. And inshallah, we'll, be, we will, we'll very soon be formally announcing this product also. Uh, banks are not happy, Sheikh Saab, Rayan Saab. Banks are not happy with this, but I'm sure they'll be able to find something. There is a good consent management uh, architecture also with this, which, which will safeguard your function. 
uh, other, uh, next slide. Other than the QR code, because now in Pakistan, on RAST, we have unified the QR code. Like many other countries in the world, now we have one QR code, and you can scan it using RAS rails, and it will, it will work fine, inshallah. Uh, <coughs> we have something else also. We have created virtual payment addresses. So for example, your client is a, uh, is, is a business called ABC Industries, and ABC Industries can have their own alias, and they can accept payments using that. We have created TIL codes. These are numbers supposed to be used on USSD, those are small phones, not the, uh, the smartphones. So th that's there as, as well. And then there are free techs also. We think charities who collect a lot of donations or government entities who collect payments or bill payments, we can digitize them using this. So all these APIs are now, are now ready. So if you, go, if you move to the next slide, and the next one. Yes. Uh, let's move on, because I already talked about RTP now and later. Yes, move on, please. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So finally, so I'll stop. So I'm just about to, yes. These are some of the APIs, a snapshot of the APIs that we have exposed to the industry. These APIs include confirmation of beneficiaries before you actually make the payment. And I think this is a very important uh, function. You can actually get real-time status confirmation about your payments. And I'm sure people who use P2P must have used this. Of course, there is a centralized addressing scheme. Merchants can get registered into that. Uh, 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 customers can get registered into that, which actually creates a, an alias. There is a whole new model for consent management. So if I want to tell my bank, like if you receive a payment request from this entity ABC, please you can clear a payment of up to 10,000 rupees. The bank can actually record it into their system and process it. This is what most of the European countries and most of the advanced countries are doing. Of course, there are issues for dispute. And finally, next slide, uh, Ras Buna integration, I thought I should talk about that very briefly. We started working with the Arab Monetary Fund last year. And uh, we had to look at, because Arab Monetary Fund is a, they offer a platform called Buna. They integrate 22 countries into that. About 108 institutions are there on that platform. And it was the first time that they were moving out of the Arab region into a non-Arab country. So <clears throat> we started talking to them. And in June last year, we signed an MOU uh, with them whereby we agreed that we will connect both the switches. We recently signed uh, two main contracts with them. Because of that, Pakistan rupee is now a seventh currency in the Buna system. Previously, there were six currencies. Now, Pakistan uh, rupee is the seventh currency. I think this is the first time that Pakistani rupee is now part of a major international uh, payment system. And inshallah, uh, uh, State Bank is also now a fund holding institution for Buna. Prime Minister recently uh, launched the, 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 uh, the project. And we are now working on the implementation details about the technicalities that would be involved and operational and governance arrangements. So inshallah with this, I hope that RAS would help us because of the ISO 2020 standard. It will help us integrate with many other international uh, systems also and will help Pakistan's economy boom as well. Uh, that's all from my side. Thank you so much. Assalamu Thank you very much, sir. It's very heartening to know about the new developments and changes which are coming in. But you know, you mentioned an example of India. We are perhaps where India was a few years ago. In 2009, India had only a 17% banking penetration when it came to their population. And things have changed. Things changed because they, they have the approach, something called the DPI system, which is the digital public infrastructure. Just like you would build a, a road or a, or a connecting highway, that is the approach. And what makes it unique is it's very different from an all private approach where there are apps and platforms and proprietary and big tech, which is what organizations would do. A government, an all government approach usually comes with government applications, government products, departments, again, slowing down things. So how, what are the three pillars of a DPI approach? The market, the governance, and the technology centers. 
The standards allow interoperability, and what it allows you to do is scalable. Make it very, very scalable for a big country like India. Is there some learning there for Pakistan is the key question. Because if we attempt to centralize every function or build a citizen-facing solution, sometimes it doesn't last for very long. So those are some of the key things which I'm sure all of you will be deliberating and debating upon. The banking sector, the entrepreneurs, everyone can actually contribute to it. And of course, there will be some great studies from across the region where there are other models available. So ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great privilege to now call upon our global guest of honor. We are very uh, you know, keen and privileged to have with us the Honorable His Excellency, the Secretary General of the Islamic Chamber of Commerce and Development. Please join me in welcoming him for his keynote address, Mr. Yusuf Hassan Khalavi. Thank you, sir. Last time in Lahore, we got an online conversation from you. It's wonderful to have you here in person. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's my real pleasure to be with you in that uh, opening ceremony in the 25th edition of, uh, of this important event. This is what we should collaborate together to work, to promote and to develop and to do everything because we live in a world which is centralized by technology. I will take that opportunity just to share with you our thought about technology. I know every single person in that uh, venue can talk about the importance of technology better than me, but let me share how we look to that concept. We believe that technology is the right gate for a better future for every single human being on our planet. Let us take it, it, let us take this very, very basic with a small device, which we call smartphone, any home, any family, in any rural area in the world can be connected to the whole world without any challenge. This never happened in the world. So basic, the basic need of education, for example, about anything else, but let me focus on education. With that huge opportunity, as I said, any single person in a rural area can be connected to the best education service in the world. This never happened before. Another basic need, but not just for an individual, for SMEs. We, ha we have seen now the presentation about the payment system. This is again a basic need for any SMEs in the world because without that pay payment system, there is almost nothing called SMEs. So this is the technology. This is how we should see the technology. It is the right gate to a better future for every single person in the world. With that importance, with that vision, we can make our world for every single per person better. In just a few years, every person, every family, every single entrepreneur can change his own future just basically with a better use of technology. So we need to make that technology more affordable, more friendly. We can talk, yes, about the AI a lot, but still we have hundreds of millions of people around the world. They need the basic, just affordable smartphone, well connection 
to internet and the whole life can change. Let me take that opportunity to thank the organizer. They did great job. We are here now in, in the edition number 25. This is something where all of us should be proud of. So a special thank to our organizer, to the whole partners. Partners, sponsors, because without that partnership, without that sponsorship, this strong event will not be able to continue since the, th the year of 2001. As, and uh, I have just a small request from, from you, Dr. Khurshid, and from Brother Omer. I, I've seen the, the slogan. The slogan is Pakistan Regional Hub. Just a small modification, just one more. So instead of saying regional, we need to say global. And this is for two reasons. Reason number one, because I don't see any challenge in that slogan. If we say we are a regional hub, okay, how many regions in the world we have? So it's, I mean something, not, there is no challenge. And for us as a human being, without challenge, we will not develop our future. So this is number one. Number two, because to have a vision to be just a regional hub, I think this is below the opportunities we already have. This is much more, be more below. And I know lots of CEOs sitting here, they understand that better than me. So the potential is really much more higher. Just imagine a nation with around 250 million population. More of half of those are young youth, eager to develop their future, eager to have a better education, better healthcare services, better everything. So you can become one of the global hub of technology. Thanks for everyone and looking forward to the outcomes of that and we are willing as an Islamic Chamber of Commerce and Development, the official representative of the Muslim private sector across the globe, we are eager to work together with all the partners sitting here to develop that vision from being a, glo a, a, a regional hub into a global hub and we are willing really to work together to guide that. I know there are lots of challenges, but the potential is there and the capacity is there. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the inaugural, um, you know, has been awaiting eagerly to hear from our chief guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the chairman of PASHA, the Pakistan IT Industry Association. Our chief guest today, please welcome him for his address, Mr. Zuhayb Khan. Bismillah rahman rahim So I just came to know that today I'm chief guest. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Saab. Um, I will not bore you a lot, but I just want to start first to thanks uh, because it's very difficult to sit in front of my two mentors in Pakistan. One is Dr. Khurshid Nizam and one is Jahara sitting in front of me. And first I would like to take permission before I move ahead because not everybody knows I started my career in Pakistan from ITC in Asia 2002 rightly about 24 years ago. And the platform Dr. Saab given to me to launch the first ever uh, portal that is ISPPakistan.com, which is still online. You can check as a museum where people used to download some uh, ringtones and some chat and all these things. So once again, thank you, Dr. Saab, and your legacy continues with your generation, the amazing leader, uh, Omer Nizam, which is our um, I think future leader for Pasha also. So 
uh, beginning um, 25 years of ITC in Asia, attending many, many conferences in the world like CBER, JITEX, LEAP, and many others, it is not uh, easy to sustain this level of conference. With every year, it's improving the content, the panel discussion, and I heard about the global CIO conference right after two days, day after tomorrow. This is the legacy, this is the quality we want to share. Now let me share some of, uh, because um, I just want to also share that uh, 30th September is going to be my last day as a chairman, Pasha, and hopefully uh, the new team will join after our Pasha election. And I just want to have quick fast forward a few of the things um, uh, it's Pasha did. Uh, definitely it was not easy, historical, the chairmanship of Pasha for used to be for a one year. But when I joined Pasha, all the association and chambers got another one year, the two years is not easy to continue as a volunteer job. But luckily, Alhamdulillah, last year in June 2023, we have Special Investment Facilitation Council. And honestly speaking, I witness whenever I attended any conference and we say, what is the role of SIFC? What Special Investment Facilitation will do? There is Agri, Energy, Mining and IT. Many Pasha chairmen, um, usually one IT minister, one usually government work with three Pasha chairmen. But in the history of Pasha, I was the first chairman with three government, three IT ministers and multiple, you know, stakeholders. But the continuity remains there, the consistency remains there, just of the one thing that is SIFC. And I really congratulate to the entire team of SIFC, Brigadier Nadir is there, uh, and other team members are also there. And when I started my journey, it's like 14 years I associated with Pasha, but I was senior vice chairman, treasurer and chairman. Um, one thing I believe, the three words are very important for anything, for any success. One, collaboration. Two, collaboration. And three, collaboration. And that's what I tried my level best to work with the organization like Pakistan Software Export Board. I am glad that the entire team, entire leadership is in Karachi. And um, all their stakeholders like uh, USF, Ignite, NITB, PITB, inclusivity, that was the need of the time. And I must say one more thing, um, um, PACB worked for hard for that also because without the government subsidy and support it is not possible to execute it. This year, Pakistan is going to get tech destination of the world during JITEX Dubai 2024, inshallah. That's the news and inshallah, JITEX already announced in the social media. And that's how Excellency Mr. Yusuf mentioned that we are really the tech destination of the world. That is tech destination Pakistan. Few things I just quickly fast forward. The success stories, 2.6 billion US dollar export. Those hal This year, June 2024 ended. We touched 3.2 billion US dollar. And I would say, this is not the actual export of IT. Actual export is three times more than that. Sohail Sahib ne bhi yun karke kaha bilkul aisi baat hai. Pravazir Azam usse kehte hain, ye dollar kyun nahi aare wapas. Bahar par kiye mein IT industry ke logo ne. Koi businessman, koi IT sector, koi freelancer, bahar paise park nahi karta. वो पैसे बाहर रखता है ताकि दुनिया में बा आसानी खर्चे कर सके रेहान साहब सामने बैठे हैं स्टैंडर्ड चार्टर्ड बैंक ग्लोबल बैंक स्टैंड स्टेट बैंक का सर्कुलर वी हैव दैट कॉर्पोरेट डेबिट कार्ड फॉर द आईटी सेक्टर माशाल्लाह काफी बैंक्स ने दे दिया एफबीआर से वी आर फाइटिंग कि उस पर 10% हम टैक्स क्यों दें जब हमारी डॉलर कमाए हुए पैसे डॉलर में रखे हुए और डॉलर में खर्च कर रहे हैं तो 10% हम टैक्स किस बात का दें तो सेकंड चीज Internet banking के जरिए बा आसानी हमारे young लोग हैं drive करते हुए दुनिया भर में repatriate करें उन dollar accounts हो I believe that uh, some of the banks already assured 
that this is going to be live for the IT sectors and freelancers in couple of months. Inshallah, you will see that in the situations, as Madam Jahan and other people have done, the small battles. Inshallah, we have big, big wars to win, and Inshallah, you, we can witness the IT sector, despite of all the challenges. July 2024, which is our numbers export, ke hai, it is touching 300 million dollars, which is far positive than the July 2023. Again, this is the sign of positivity and the culture. One request for, since I'm, I'm, I'm in ITC and Asia right now, we have a lot of talent and made in Pakistan in Pakistan. Hum jab, I, I believe ke just na products, Rast hai ya or banking ke andar itni badi badi product use ho rahi hai. We need to encourage made in Pakistan product. Aur ye hum kar sakte hai. Agar hum UAE ka national payment gateway bana sakte hai. More than 60% African market ka stock exchange ka software manage kar sakte hai. To ye core banking chalana ya Pakistan ki dunya bhar mein IT ke liye cheez karna koi badi baat nahi hai. We need to have a strict policy to encourage Made in Pakistan software, not just in banking sector, in all the sector. You can see in halls, we have super talented human resource management system for cyber security, for artificial intelligence. You will find it. Last two things. Since um, 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 there are a lot of things moving around in terms of the continuity, um, Zahirap, in the history of Pasha, first time, 10 all the board members are retiring and inshallah we have uh, election to move in order to continue the legacy and continuity inshallah we will have great 10 members announced very soon to have and encourage and support and in order to have the continuity in pasha that's what we need from the from the it sector one of my friends owned by the Tiplex, they announced they, they, they mentioned, they did some research, the first ever artificial bot chairman they launched during ITC and Asia today and there it will be live very like in couple of hours where you can talk to me virtually and ask what's happening in IT sector and what was the policy and what we did during. So it's just uh, uh, stuff uh, was uh, on a lighter note I just wanted to do. Once again, Dr. Saab, your team, PACB team, my Pasha team, we have a Pasha stand, Tech Destination Pakistan stand, any question, anything you have, all these tech team are here in Karachi. Inshallah, Barsad enjoy kare, Pakistan Zindaba. Thank you very much, Zuhayb. And once again, we'd like to acknowledge Tech Destination Pakistan, the title partner for the 25th edition of ITCN Asia. And also, this show is powered by Huawei. Ladies and gentlemen, may we now take this opportunity to give away a few souvenirs uh, to our distinguished guests, without whom today's event would not have been possible. May I take this opportunity to invite the Honorable Chief Guest, Mr. Zuhayb Khan, and also the Group President of e Commerce Gateway, Dr. Khurshid Nizam, to please join us up on stage. May I also request Mr. Umair Nizam to please join us up on stage and Brigadier Nadir from the SIFC to please join us up on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, may we request our global guest of honor, His Excellency Yusuf, ha Yusuf Hassan Khalavi, the Secretary General of ICCD, to please join us up on stage as well. Thank you, gentlemen. We'd like to give away these souvenirs to all our speakers present at the inaugural session for giving it an energetic startup. May I request our friends from media to please, if they could step down uh, from the stage and you know capture it from behind, uh, from below the stage, because the cameramen behind you are finding it difficult. Ji Janab. So first and foremost, may I request the country principal officer and education lead Microsoft, Mr. Gibran Jamshed, to accept this souvenir.
Next up, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to present a souvenir to the head of public policy programs, Middle East, Turkey, Africa, Pakistan, and South Asia. For TikTok, please welcome Ms. B Zara Basharat Higgs. May I request our friends from media to please uh, vacate the steps as our guests are unable to get on the stage. May I request the cameraman to please step down and make at least one side clear so that our speakers can come up. May I now request the Vice CEO of Public Affairs of Huawei Mr. Ray Yusha Oeng, to please join us up on stage and accept this souvenir. May I request Mr. Ray to please stay on stage with us and may I request Mr. Gibran Jamshed and Ms. Zara Basharat to please come and join us up on stage and stay with us for the group picture. May I request you to kindly um, be on the side of the stage as uh, the others receive their souvenirs. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the founder and CEO of Catalyst Labs, Madam Jaha Ara, to please accept her souvenir. Thank you, ma'am. May I request you to please stay with us. Next up, please welcome the CEO of Standard Chartered Pakistan and also the president of OICCI, Mr. Rehan Sheikh. Up. Please stay with us on stage. Next up, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Zishan Khatak, the Chief Executive Officer, CEO of Pakistan Software Export Board. May I now request uh, Sayyid Suhail Jawad, the Executive Director of uh, Digital Financial Services Group at the State Bank of Pakistan, to please join us up on stage. May we now request the Honorable Chief Guest and our Global Ch uh, Guest of Honor to please present a souvenir to Brigadier Nadir of uh, SIFC for his contribution and support to the IT professionals and the IT industry of Pakistan. Ladies and gentlemen, may we now request the Honorable Chief Guest and Dr. Kursheed Nizam to please present a souvenir to His Excellency, Mr. Yusuf Hassan Khalavi, the Secretary General of the Islamic Chamber of Commerce and Development. And last but definitely not the least, may I request Dr. Khushid Nizam to please present a souvenir to the Honorable Chief Guest, Mr. Zuhaib Khan, the Chairman of Pasha.
May I now request all our distinguished guests and speakers to please come together for a group photograph. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. With this, the inauguration session of the 25th ITC in Asia comes to a close. But there's lots to look forward to and learn and unlearn. May you collaborate and find more interesting opportunities in the next two days.